Uh, I wanted to say a few more things about columns, um, particularly, I mean, practical things maybe, uh, to help you with your, um, that tower project. You do have to, uh, not this Wednesday, but the following Wednesday, I think, is the uh, due date for the preliminary report. So I'll go ahead and, and uh, set up a sign-up sheet uh, that we'll hang up upstairs like we did last semester, and you can um, sign up for groups, get in, the, get in a group of, how many are supposed to be in a group, three or four? Three or four, okay, three or four. <laughs> and um, anyway, and then get going on that because, um, I mean, you just have this week and one more weekend, right, basically, to organize yourselves and do something. I'm trying to remember what we said in that preliminary report. I re redid some of the, the rules for this thing, which will maybe be interesting. So read what, it, read what the requirements are, because I'm not going to remember in my head whether you have to do uh, what kind of calculations we were asking for for that preliminary. Some sort, if I remember right, you're supposed to make some sort of estimate as to what the capacity is that the thing's going to carry. Uh, it, there's a limb, I mean, there's a, a minimum. I think it has to hold a minimum of 25 pounds. It has to be a minimum of some height, 40 inches or something. You have to read the sheet. And, um, but then you can, you can, it can carry more weight and you get kind of more points. There's a formula in there. You can look at the formula and try and dis decide your strategy. But in terms of determining the capacity of the thing, you could, you could use the Euler equation, of course. Uh, when you go to use it, you'll find there's one, one number that might be you're not too certain of, and that's the Young's modulus for the material. Hmm. Uh, you can look up, I think, there, I think we even posted online Young's modulus for basswood or something, and you can look it up for other woods for balsa wood. I mean, if you just Google Young's modulus and whatever wood you're thinking of, you probably will find something. But uh, on the scale of, of a model, that there can be a bit of variation there. So that that'll be your biggest, if you, if you use the formula, that'll be the biggest um, piece of, of erroneous data or, you know, the source of, the greatest source of error probably in the equation because you're, uh, there is a lot of variation in, in this kind of wood um, as to the strength. Balsa wood, by the way, comes in a lot of different grades. It's graded by density. Usually when you buy it at the, if you buy it at the hardware store, or where would you buy it, model, or model shop or something, uh, they're not going to say anything about what it is, but um, the, the, it, it comes in different weights, kind of, and you can, you could, people like model builders Airplane builders maybe like to get the very lightweight uh, wood. Of course, the denser is going to be stronger, but we're also looking at weight. So you may prefer the to try to get the lighter weight wood. So it's a there's a trade-off between the strength. I mean, you could use uh, southern pine. We're going to open it up. I think it's one thing I did changing the rules. You don't have to use basswood. You can use any wood you want. You can go pick up a if you want to do this. Uh, inexpensively, you don't have to buy any basswood. You could go pick up a piece of scrap wood in the in the wood shop and saw it up into pieces. Uh, it'll be a little bit heavier that way, though, because that wood <coughs> tends to be heavier than, say, balsa wood or mm, basswood. It's also not too dense. But anyway, so as a technique for determining the strength without using Young's modulus, you could do it fairly probably more accurately, experimentally. For instance, if I had this piece of wood, if I wanted to use it at this length in my model, I could tell fairly accurately how strong it is. Here, but since I don't have my glasses on, <laughs> we will have, uh, because this takes, it's a two person, this way you're working in, in groups. You're you shaking. put, I haven't loaded it yet, <laughs> just calm down. <laughs> Can you read it? All right. Pay attention, this goes fast. Okay. You ready? Um, uh, you've got to read the number. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> All right. It's roughly a quarter of 
No, no, I'm not done yet. I haven't even started yet. Pay attention. Okay, you you load it until it fails or so or or, or there it buckled. Okay. So it's not once it buckles, it's not going to carry any more load. All right. So roughly 2.5. 2.5 pounds. There you go. You could have a shorter piece. Huh? Same same piece of wood. Yeah, yeah, yeah. We're not done yet. This is same piece of wood. How strong is this one? Ooh, maxed it out. Oh, okay, this one's stronger than 10 pounds. That one wasn't a very good example. Maybe this one. Okay, yeah, this one's taller. Okay, this is, this is a dowel, which is uh, probably pine. I don't think it's uh, basswood. Oh, no. 2.25. What if this one were smaller? What if we halved it? So if, we, if it's half the length, Right, this is, the slenderness ratio is uh, L over R, right? So I just reduce the slenderness ratio by half. But the slender, in the equation, in, in the buckling equation, the slenderness ratio is squared, right? So I should have, by halving it, I should have increased it by a factor of four, right? Half squared, or, you know, two squared. So it should go from... What would you say it was? So I should, should go almost up to 10. <laughs> Did it? 9.5. There we go. All right. <laughs> so, um, of course, if you break it, it's going to be a little bit hard to use that. You, well, you could use a similar member. Anyway, you can, you can determine. I'll, I'll put this out there. Uh, so you can use it uh, on, on the, the white bins down here. If you would, leave it. Don't, don't carry it. If you carried it up to the studio, then nobody's going to be able to find it. So if you would, if you want, come down, you know, and load your members, figure out how strong they are. And maybe you can make some determinations with that. On the scale, there, that's a scale of individual members, obviously. On the scale of the, the whole uh, column, that would also have a buckling mode, right? The whole thing together as a, uh, and that probably, I mean, here you're looking at a, you know, some sort of um, trust situation probably, and it's got the, the load on it like that. In, in terms of anal analyzing it, you might make the assumption that it's going to buckle uh, not like this, but probably like this, that because this is a free end, uh, that it's more likely to, to fail by tipping over or, or buckling as a, as a whole column, I would guess. There'd be no reason why it would buckle like that because this isn't held. So it'd be much more likely to buckle like that and just the, the, the friction and the, the load bearing of it down here is going to to hold it in place. As long as those stay put, then it would have a mode like that. If one of these starts to lift up, well, if it lifts off the ground, then you're <laughs> then the story's over anyway. You're, you're gone. So, so before it tips over, it would, it would probably be buckling in a mode like that. And then if that's the case, then you've got a, a k equal to 2, right? And you could use maybe, I mean, you probably wouldn't want to build this in, in Lomua. You could in limited sense, but, you know, that's what the ultimate test is, right, that we're going to put. Then we'll really know how strong it is. But, but you could estimate it maybe with, with um, Euler's equation. Mm. You could take the, um, as a cross-section, you could take maybe a cross-section here somewhere and look at it. You know, this would be the, the cross-section and determine the moment of inertia of that about, you know, the axis, a center axis. So that would give you I, then you could calculate R, then you could can, and use the area from that, so that and the and the height. So there would give you the slenderness ratio, and then you just have to there you you would have to come up with some sort of number for the E modulus. You oh, you could you could calculate based on on if you tested a few pieces like this, then back calculate the E modulus based on on where these are failing. You know like. You know the, the, the section, all the sectional properties of it. You know the load capacity. The only unknown would be E. So you could use the, 
the, your little test and, and, and the Euler-Buckling equation to calculate E, then apply E to this and, and figure it out for the, oh, that would be pretty clever. Yeah, you should do that. Okay. Um, <clears throat> now, this week we're going to go into um, another topic, combined materials. And these, uh, the most common application is, yeah, you can turn this off for a second, is flitched beams. Uh, also, any composite. Uh, maybe it's not. Maybe this isn't the most common application. Actually, the most common application is probably something like a sandwich panel, or uh, things that are laminated uh, for strength. Mm, SIP panels now are an example, right? Those are pretty common. Uh, uh, a flitched beam is maybe not so common, but it's the the where you make a beam a little stronger. Usually in light wood framing, uh, you put a steel plate between a couple of 2x12s, and uh, it increases the strength quite a bit. So that's one application of this. And um, when you look at what's going on, if you have uh, a cross section like this that has a uh, one material here and another material up there. Uh, the, the first assumption is that you're going to have to assume that the materials are, are completely bonded together. That we're not, we're not worried about the, the slippage between them, which in a real um, uh, section or in a real uh, uh, product or material, you would, that would be a major concern. You'd have to design and, and remember, the, end, the very last topic, the end of last semester, was that calculating that shear force. So you might do something like that and, and make sure you specify a glue that has that shear capacity. But assuming you've got that bond, assuming they, they are bonded, when you, when you stress the material, when you put a load on it, it's going to deform under the load, and it's going to deform the same. Uh, it's going because it's joined together. The strain, uh, the strains are the same, at least at the same point uh, in the material. Uh, for example, and here you, you can turn this back up for a second. If I have, if I have a uh, something like this, get this guy out of the way. Uh, this is this has obviously got a, a certain strain. I'm putting a load on it, and it and it uh, um, strains or or deforms a certain amount. If I join the two of them together, this this material and this, then I'd have this composite, kind of similar to to what's up there. And when I when I load it now, if I you know loaded it evenly. Uh, the both materials, this, this piece of wood, which is much stiffer, and the, the foam, are going to deform the same amount. You know, they'd have to. It's not like, it's not like this one's suddenly going to go, woo, like this, and this one's up here. No, they're, they're, they're glued together. So they've got to stay, whatever load I put on it, their deformation, their strain, is going to be the same. So you get, now you can turn that back off a little bit. Uh, so this is the, this right here is the strain diagram. Here they're the same, right? The strain in, in this material up here is exactly the same. This is how much it's deforming, say. Exactly the same all the way across. This is a little column. But, but because the, the one material is much stiffer than the other, uh, in my little, little example with these, obviously the wood is carrying a lot more load and a lot more stress than the than the the foam you know it went from being very crushable to suddenly it's very strong well that that stiffness came uh, about the bad fact that I'm putting more load on it this isn't carrying more load this is suddenly the what I added the stiffer material is carrying a lot of load and the reason is because although they strain the same amount uh, they carry, they pick up uh, very different amounts of load for that amount of strain. If I have a, uh, a weak material like this, this foam, well, I can, I can crush it like, okay, 
half an inch, a strain, put a half inch strain on it, no problem. But if this were a steel block, you know, the same size, but have a different material, be out of steel, I couldn't just strain it a half an inch, not, not so easily. It would take a lot more force to, because it has a much greater stiffness, right? Each material, remember by Young, that is Young's modulus, is the, the amount of stiffness, material stiffness it has. That's the relationship of stress to strain. So I've, although I've got the, the strain constant, the stress sure won't be constant because the two materials have very different E moduli, right? The E modulus of this foam is, is way down two and a half or something. And the E modulus for uh, this piece of wood is up around, I don't know, two million maybe. <laughs> I think two million. Okay, so from two and a half to two million, <laughs> there's a huge difference in, the, in uh, the material stiffness of these. So of course, uh, when the st although the strains are identical, the stiffer material picks up the, gr the greater stress. So you get a diagram like this. The strain's the same, but suddenly this material is, boom, jumps way out here, and this material's not, not really stressed very high. In, in uh, flexure, if I take the same cross-section, now this is the, the uh, uh, strain diagram for flexure. You remember it's... Um, the outer fibers are stretching more. This is because in flexure, this is a series of arcs, right? This is being bent into a series of arcs. And the, the top arcs uh, being closer to the center of radius are being compressed. The bottom arcs are being stretched. And the arcs right here on the neutral axis aren't being strained at all. They're not, they're just kind of following the curve, but they're not, they're not changing uh, dimension. So, um, as you follow this up, uh, this is also linear, but when you change materials, suddenly for this same strain here, uh, this material carries much more stress. So if this were our, our foam and wood or something, the foam doesn't carry very much, but the wood, would, it would suddenly jump and carry quite a bit. Right at this, uh, at this interface here, um, Right, this F, mm, let me see what these, yeah, well, anyway, the, the stress at, at this strain, the stress jumps. Here's this, this is the stress in the wood, and at that exact same spot, or, you know, just an infinitesimal the other side into the steel, uh, the stress jumps. So this is a, this is a nonlinear behavior. This kind of, uh, this is not the sort of assumption we made back when we looked at, at calculating I and using it in MC over I. Remember, we calculated stress for beams, MC over I, and the, the assumption there with the I and that equation to calculate stress at some point in the beam was that the, the uh, uh, stress diagram looked the same as the strain diagram. The strain diagram looked like this, and the stress diagram also was linear. So now we have a nonlinear uh, stress diagram. It has that little bump in the middle. So you're going to have to uh, make some modifications before you could really calculate what the stresses are. Uh, what the mod what, what's done, the modification that's made, is to convert this into, or, or um, hmm, convert this into a shape that would be equivalent in stiffness but produce a, a, uh, a linear uh, stress. So we can kind of, well, no, I'm sorry, not this. Yeah, 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 this, yeah, yeah. The, it, it's a transformed section. You transform the, the original section. So, okay. This, this shows that the, the, uh, this relationship here, uh, together with the, the um, stress-strain diagrams, this is the, the slope of this curve is actually Young's modulus, right? This is stress over strain, and stress over strain is the uh, uh, Young's modulus. So this, this might have a, a Young's modulus of, of 
uh, I don't know, 30,000 or something. And this might have a, a Young's modulus of maybe 10,000. It's less. This one is less stiff than this material. This more uh, vertical, that, that curve right there, the stiffer the material is because it's picking up more stress for the same amount of strain. So at this strain of, of point uh, of, well, whatever that is, at strain one, at that interface there, you've got, here are the two different materials, and the two different materials will have two different stresses. I mean, the, the material, the weaker material has this stress, and at the exact same strain, the, s the stiffer material has this stress. So that's why you see this jump. There's this, this stress, FB is, is back there, and then on the stress diagram, there's uh, the other stress way up there. So that's the jump. And yet they have exactly the same, they share the same uh, strain diagram. They have exactly the same strains. The, the fact that they share the strain diagram or that they have the same strains is usually called strain compatibility. That they're, mm, the, the diagrams are compatible or or basically it just means that they're being uh, strained the same, that these, although the stresses may be different because they have different uh, stiffnesses, the strains are, are the same. Now this, is the, this is a useful equation in being able to go from here to here. This is how you'd, you could calculate, given, given this strain, okay, if you had that strain and you wanted to calculate what these, uh, you know, form, create this diagram, well, then you just need you'd need uh, Young's modulus for these two materials, all right? Assuming you had that, there'd be a, a Young's modulus for material A and a material B Young's modulus, and you'd multiply both of them by the the strain, and you'd get these two different uh, numbers. Then you get these these values, right? Yeah. The one other caveat here, you have to be careful when you're doing this that you don't. Uh, if you just plug in the numbers, say, to this equation, Young's, just that number Young's modulus doesn't um, tell you what the limit is. There is a limit to uh, the stress that you could get from the elastic. There is an elastic limit, right? That's the yield stress. So if I plugged in a strain of maybe, instead of this much, maybe I plugged in a strain that was, say, this much, was over here, double this amount, okay, I doubled the strain. I could still, you know, initially you'd say, oh, you'll just get double numbers from both of them. Well, maybe not. You'd get uh, a double the number from this one maybe because it's still in the linear range, but if I go up here, well, double the number would be up there, but the graph doesn't go up there, you see. At some point, you reach an elastic limit. So that's one thing you have to be careful of, that you don't exceed the yield stress of either material, that you don't start uh, giving answers that are beyond, you know, putting numbers down on this diagram that would be beyond the, the yield stress of the material that it really wouldn't reach. Uh, okay, so the way you make this, uh, that you can still use uh, MC over I, that it, you can still calculate uh, flexural stresses, um, with this kind of condition with composite materials is by, by creating a, a, uh, uh, a transform section and an Zotz section that um, has the properties, are, are, well, it's it, what, you, what you have to do is, is think, well, the reason I have nonlinear s stress diagram is because I have two different materials, right? If I, if I just had the whole thing made out of one material, then I'd be back to a linear stress diagram. Then everything would be okay. Well, then why don't I do this? Instead of, of having these two different materials, uh, why don't I do it all out of foam? And I'll just use as a, an equivalent amount of, of foam to replace the wood that would, be, that would have the same um, capacity or the same strength as the wood. So, I mean, to replace this piece of wood, I'm going to have, a, have to have a ton of foam, right? I'd also have to, in, if I'm going to calculate the flexure of it, it would, have to be, it would have to be in the same 
relationship to the neutral axis. So if I'm going to put more foam in there, I can't make it deeper. I have to just make it uh, more foam this way. So you increase the area by what's called a modular ratio, a ratio of the stiffness of the, of the two materials, uh, to the point that it's uh, then going to be have the same effective stiffness as if it were the original section. So you create a section all out of one material that has the same behavior or the same uh, stiffness behavior as the original composite material. So in this case, here I've got uh, this material uh, that's got 20,000 uh, KSI uh, Young's modulus, and this material only has 5,000 KSI. There's 20,000 at the bottom again. So I, I look at the two. This is a weaker one, and I can, it's essentially like a scale factor, this modular ratio. If I say uh, this would be the 5 and this would be the 20, okay, 20 over 5 would be 4, right, would be 4. So I've got a scale factor of 4. That means I've got to scale the, the area of the uh, stiffer material by a factor of 4. I can't change it this way. I can only change it with regards to the, the uh, neutral axis um, horizontally, right? Because if I go, if I go this way, then I'm, I'm geometrically making it stiffer. If I go horizontally, I'm not changing anything. I'm just increasing the area. So, uh, I mean, the, hmm. well, okay. <laughs> the more I say that, it'll probably get more confusing. So, so here I've got uh, 1 times 4. I multiply, that, that area would be 4. Multiply that area by 4, and you get 16. So that would be then a rectangle 1 by 16. Right? So there it scales up to uh, a piece 16. So this would be, now this is my uh, transformed section. And it's, it has the same stiffness as this section but it's made entirely out of material B, whatever that is, something. It's a little stiffer than wood. I have no idea what that is. Some, maybe it's brass. <laughs> something that's uh, got that Young's modulus. Now, now with this section, now if I, if I used it and I drew a, a, um, a stress diagram, it would be linear it would be a linear stress because it's all the same material. It would be, we'd be back to the way we did beams before. But the difference is now it looks like this. So, uh, you know, it's, it's still, it's MC over I, but I'm going to have a different I. So I have to calculate the, the I, a new I based on that geometry. It's obviously going to be a much higher I, right, because I, I have increased the area. And, and in a critical area, uh, a critical spot in this case at the extreme fibers. So that I will be bigger, uh, but it'll be equivalent in stiffness to, to this one. So, you know, you can now, now you're, you're able to use the uh, MC over I and everything, everything's a little easier. Um, the application for these things. Um, in beams, these are, uh, I guess, different s advantages or scenarios where you might use them. This is, this is a typical flitched beam. It has a piece of steel between uh, two pieces of wood. This is, these might be called scab plates. They're on the, the outside. They don't have to be full depth. Uh, they don't have to be steel. You could do it with aluminum, although aluminum only has about half the stiffness of steel. Oh, less, a third of the stiffness, I think. So that's not really going to be so effective maybe as using steel would be. You can use them, you know, in a, in a situation like this, if you imagine the uh, moment diagram, you'd have a big, out here the moment's zero, right? You'd have a big negative moment. Then if it were nicely balanced, I'm not sure what this one looks like, the moment it would come up, but maybe not very high, be fairly low through here. And then it'd have another big peak down here and go up. So you've got two peak moments around there. You, you could, rather than designing the, the full length of the beam for this peak moment, you could have a, 
uh, a piece of wood that was strong enough to carry, say, the moment in this area, and then strengthen it uh, additionally, uh, just where it needs the additional capacity, by putting scab plates on the side. You could, you know, bolt those onto the side uh, just over a certain length of it. So that would be an application. And that would be maybe um, less expensive. You probably wouldn't do this for <coughs> economic reasons because there's so much labor in putting the thing together. The, the main advantages, I guess, is you'd, you'd uh, get a shallower section. That would probably be the, the scenario where these would, would be useful. Um, because they're stiffer than the wood alone, you'd be able to have a, a shallower section. So maybe, maybe, two, uh, maybe a, a couple of 2x12s would be strong enough out here, but in here they wouldn't be. And rather than using 2x14s or 2x16s, which might not be available, you could use these scab plates and, get, and still use your uh, wood beams in there. They have, in lightweight framing, uh, wood framing, they have the advantage that it, uh, something like this could be used fairly compatibly with, with wood construction because I mean, you could set joists on top of this. You could put, you know, hangers on this. You can nail into it. If, if instead of this, you had a, a, a steel W section, well, it's really hard to nail wooden joists onto a steel W section. So it gets to be a little bit messy. Um, and it would also be heavier. Potentially, you'd have to have a crane come to the site to, to erect this one. You know, you have one lousy beam that's maybe longer, maybe it goes over a, a three-car garage or something, and you know, you'd have to have a crane come out to the site just to place that one steel beam. Well, if you did it with something like this, you could feasibly, feasibly even lift it up in, in pieces. It would be lighter maybe than the W section to begin with, and you could even, if, if you wanted to do it by hand, you could lift this up in place, then lift that up in place, then lift that up, you know, a piece at a time, and then assemble it up there and bolt it together. It'd be possible. It might be easier than something else. So those are maybe uh, rationales for, for doing that. Um, what else does it say here? Less deep, yeah, stronger than wood alone, yeah. Longer spans, so long spans might be a situation where you ha would want to use it. And with scab plates. Okay. The other thing I might mention here, you can turn the light on again. Um, and this will be easier. I, it's a little bit harder than, I don't know if I can set this in. Oh, yeah, I could do that. Another application, too, is the other way around. Um, I don't have a piece of wood to stick in here, but sometimes you'll have a, an existing, this might be a situation where you have an existing steel beam in a uh, structure. And you need, it needs to be just a little bit stronger. And you could, uh, I mean, you don't want to go through, if it's a renovation, maybe you don't want to remove the beam and replace it with a bigger beam. That's too much trouble. You could maybe weld a piece underneath it, but then it's deeper, and that's a lot of trouble. You have to get welders in there. I've seen scenarios where they do, for strength, infill it with wood pieces. You can put, you know, however, maybe thicker than just the flange, but it, put pieces of wood and bolt them together in the, inside the, the W section. And then it, it doesn't change the shape of it, but it does get stronger. Uh, not, not as strong go as going the other way, because you're, you're adding the weaker material. But still, it might, if you don't need a lot of extra strength. The other thing would be, you know, um, if you pretend this is wood for a minute. Uh, oh, hey, you could pretend this is wood. Hmm, yeah. uh, that's not too good. Well, yeah, this, well, this would make the point, I guess. This would work, too. At any rate, or just pretend this other one's wood. It doesn't matter. Pretend this is wood. And this is steel. Pretend this is steel. Eh, you don't have to pretend too much. Uh, it's, if you, the other thing you have to pay attention to in designing these regarding the, the yield stress, you can't just uh, put any load on this uh, at some point, like, or, or, well, just think of this. Uh, imagine the behavior of these two. If I clamped them together, maybe I was going 
actually do it with clamps, but I don't think I'll take the time now. If I clamped them all together so it was really bonded, and I loaded this, um, it would be stiffer, right? But think of the failure mode. What, what would be the, the ultimate the, uh, failure in this? What would happen? Say, okay, load it. Yeah, it's okay. Load it some more. It's okay. Load it. <laughs> What's eventually going to happen? The weaker material might not fail. It would be more likely, perhaps, that the stronger material would fail, which might not be intuitive. You might not think, huh, the steel's going to fail? The wood doesn't fail and the steel fails? Well, yeah, maybe. Because uh, if I bend this enough, maybe if this were stiffer, you'd see it. I don't think I'm going to actually get, get it to do it here. Uh, but eventually what would happen is I bend it enough that I'd bend this. This would yield plastically, and the thing would just bend, right, and it'd permanently. Because I'd bend it, and it would bend and get, a, and get a kink in it, and then that would be, that would be failed. It doesn't collapse on the ground like wood would be a little bit more spectacular because the fibers break and the thing falls on the ground. But when, this, when you reach the yield point of the steel, even though it has a lot more capacity, you pretty much have to call it failed because it's bent. You know, then your floor is permanently like that, and you can't really, you can't really call that okay. You know, the owners call you out there, look, my floor looks like this. That's okay. <laughs> no, it's not okay. <laughs> so. Uh, so you have to kind of pay attention to the, the yield stress, particularly in designing them, that you don't exceed the yield capacity of the material. And we'll see that when we get to the, to the uh, I think, the design problem, maybe. All right. Yeah, let's do, uh, yeah, turn those back off. And let's see. I think there's analysis that, that must be in here somewhere. Analysis procedure. Okay, so here's the, here's the steps you go through to to analyze one of these. Analysis assumes we've got the, the section given to us, right? We have a section. Somebody said, whoa, look, look what I found in my ceiling. How strong do you think this is? And you could, you could say, oh, I can tell you that. Um, first, we have to determine the uh, E moduli, the E modulus for each material. Uh, and then we have to determine a modular ratio. So you find the E modulus to this has to be, what well, happens to be uh, 20,000, this is 5,000. Oh, seems so familiar. And then you, you put one over the other and you get this number, N. Um, there could be, you know, this is uh, usually set up so that the base material here, the one that goes in the denominator, is the weakest material. That way your N will always be greater than 1. In concrete, you do this exactly the opposite, as we'll see in an another few weeks. But, but with this, it just, it's just an ease. You could do it the other way around. There's no, you won't, you'll get the exact same answer, but it would mean instead of scaling this bigger, it would scale smaller. You'd cut it by four, so you'd get a little, a little bump of stuff. That, well, it's just kind of awkward to play with. Uh, it's easier to, to, to do it like this. Or, or let me see, oh no, this would have gotten thinner. I'm sorry, I said it backwards. But, but if you set it up so the, the weakest material is the base, and then the stronger material's on top, you'll get a number bigger than, than one, and that number becomes a scale factor to scale the area. Uh, there could be more, it could be a couple, I think in the example we do, there are three different materials. However many materials you have, you'll have a different modular ratio for each material, because you have a different material there. The base. You'd keep the base the same for all of them, though. Uh, otherwise, it gets real confusing. OK, then you make a transform section. You build this thing. Then you determine the moment of inertia. So you calculate this thing for, for this. Then you calculate the flexural stress using this. So then you, you take this number that you got using this applied to that and put this in here. Then when you calculate the stress, you've got to unscale it which means you've got to put this factor back in there uh, for the material. And that gives you the true stress in the material. If you, if you didn't do that, you wouldn't be getting, mm, you wouldn't get the right, you wouldn't get the stress in this material. You'd get, yeah, well, you just have to do that. You have to put that number in here, and then you get the, the stress that would be occurring in that section. So as an example, here we go. Here's a, here's a really fancy flitched beam. I mean, one material wasn't enough. We got aluminum on the outside. 
want aluminum because it looks so satiny, smooth, had this polished uh, kind of tech look, although from below, for some reason, it just has wood. And then steel in the center, just a little bit for fun, and wood in here. Uh, this is the load diagram, really kind of strange, but that's the way it is. Um, and we want to know, what on earth do we want to know? One kind of wonders, what do we want to know here? For the compass, <laughs> oh, oh, find the stress level there, <laughs> that could be it. We want to find that stress level. So we've got the load, we've got the section, and we just want to know what the, maybe whether it passes or fails, that would be kind of good to know, but at least what, what the, uh, the stress is. And the stress, the stress is going to be different in each of these materials, right? Right? The weaker material probably is going to have less stress. The stiffer the material, it may have more stress. But then on the other hand, this steel is closer to the neutral axis. It, there isn't any steel up here. So it probably isn't going, it, it's not going to be strained as much. You know, down here it's not going to be strained as much as up here. This will have more strain. So, okay, that comes into it. So step number one, uh, using the lowest E, find these uh, modular ratios. For, so we've got 12, these are all to 10 to the third. So this is 12,000, 30,000, that's actually a point there, 1.5. So this is one point, oh, sorry, KSI, yeah, 1,000 KSI. So 1 1.5 thousand KSI, 30,000 KSI, 12,000 KSI. This is the smallest, 1.5. So we use that one here, okay? And then we make a, a modular ratio. Well, the modular ratio for the wood is, well, it's based on wood, so that's gonna come out to be 1.0. The wood's not gonna scale. Aluminum, it's the 12 over 1.5. That gives us eight, a scale factor of eight. And the steel is 30 uh, over 1.5, so that gives us a factor of 20. So these are then the scale factors that we have to multiply uh, the areas by, right, to get the same. And since, since you're going to keep the height the same, when you multiply it, it's just expanding it horizontally by that factor. So if I've got, there's, there's this shape for the aluminum. The aluminum was originally, there's the aluminum on the outside, it was a quarter of an inch. So now I'm going to factor it by the, uh, the modular ratio for the aluminum is 0.8. Now it's going to be two inches. So I've got two inches and two inches. So there's, there's the aluminum now. The new aluminum is two inches thick. Uh, the steel was a half inch. It gets multiplied by this factor of 20, modular ratio 20. That ends up as 10. So then it goes from a little half inch up to 10 inches. But it keeps the same depth, has the same depth still. You're just uh, increasing the width. So now you've got, now you've got a, a picture like that. You have to calculate the, the moment of inertia. This is the transformed section, is what this is called. It's been transformed. Uh, we're pretending the wood is full depth, by the way. I mean, normally wood wouldn't be quite two inches thick, but we'll, we'll use these numbers. Uh, so this is, this is a piece of cake, just a couple of rectangles, right? These, these you could actually combine, you know, you can shift them any direction as long as they don't change this. Uh, you shift them, shift them horizontally, you just can't change your height. So I could put these, and it won't affect the moment of inertia. I could put these over here and have a rectangle that would be 2, 4, 6, 8 by 12. This was, there it is, 12. So there's the 8 by 12D cubed. That's, that's those. And then I've got the steel in the middle. That was, that's a 10 by 8. 10 wide by 8 deep cubed, and that gives me that. So that's the, the transformed moment of inertia. So I can take this number now and, whoops, not yet, <laughs> and put it in MC over I, but first I got to get M. So M based on this load diagram, okay, well, you can go back and place with if you like to do it with diagrams, you could do it like this. There's the um, total area here is six from that triangle. That's, that's that six is actually the area. So that gives a uh, end reaction of six, which would be a, a shear of six. This is linear, so this is parabolic. A parabolic going from six down to 
zero here in the middle because it's like, well, uh, mm, because for a symmetric beam, the shear in the middle is zero anyway. Um, that gives an area of 24, so that would be this. Or you could just do it by, this is the same thing over again by summing moments. If I cut a section at the center line, if I know that's where the, the symmetric beam, that's where the max moment's going to be, then I could just say sum moments at that point and get that, that max moment. So 6 times 12, going that way, 6 times 8, minus 6 times 8, and a clockwise, going the other way, minus that one, and it comes out 24. So there's, that's all that's just to get the moment. So assuming you get the moment, so now you know that, because you knew the load. You knew the load, you actually know the moment. Then you've got the moment of inertia, MC over I. You've got you've to look at C's, right? So to plug it into this equation, MC over I, you have to remember that you have to stick the N in there, and the C is the depth uh, of the, the extreme fiber depth for each material. So for, which one's this? This is aluminum. The aluminum, where is it? Where the heck's that aluminum? Here's the aluminum. The aluminum's going to be from the, from the neutral axis, 6. And the wood is 6. But this one's not 6. This one is something less. I forget what. Oh, this was only 8 inches. So this one must be 4 from the neutral axis. OK, so there's the 6. Uh, there's the modular ratio for the aluminum. You put those all in. And you come out with, this is then the extreme fiber stress in the aluminum, uh, 8.76 KSI. Then you check it against the, the yield stress for the aluminum is, is uh, in this case, 35. So that's OK. Not even close. Here's the steel. Now the steel is only, it's the C. The C term is 4 because it's not as deep. There's a modular ratio much higher, so that pushes the stress up because it's so much stiffer, uh, and you end up with 14.6. Mm, it's still not even half a 36, so you're not even close to the, the uh, yield point. So that would be the stress in, in the steel. Here's the stress in the wood. It uh, has a modular ratio of 1. It has the half, the half a 12 is the depth. These are, this is converting this. From, this is kip feet into kip inches, by the way. That converts it into inches each time. And that comes out with uh, 1.09. So, ooh, actually, of the three, this one's, this one's probably the closest to failure, right? This is one and a half. This is less than half. This is less than, way less than half. So this would be, if you, if you started increasing the load now, you say, OK, it's safe. It's safe, it's safe, it's safe. For under that loading, they were all safe. None of, them, none of them yielded. If we took this, the yield stress as the failure point, say. If I want to increase the load, if I want to know the capacity, then I could start increasing the load, or, or I could take this one. This one looks like the one that would go first. Uh, I could solve for the moment. Put, put 1.5 in there, solve for the moment, leave all the other numbers the same, solve for the moment, and that would be my failure load then. Right? That would be the capacity. You'd want to check it. I guess you'd have to check it. Maybe the others make sure you pick the right one that failed first. Because one, only one of the three. It'd be pretty bizarre if all three materials failed at exactly the same point. It could happen, but it would be pretty bizarre. Usually, you have to find which of the three or which of the <coughs> two or whatever in the composite fails first. So here's a little thing you can do. Um, for section, right? Yes. Here's a quiz that'll be answered in recitation. <laughs> if if you had this this thing, and you can you can download this. I think it's in the the uh, the PowerPoint. Uh, if you had these two materials, this is steel, this is aluminum, and I s had them in the thing like this. This was the example we had, and I strain it, and this strain is exactly. 0.001, then what what would be these what would be those stresses? Simple question. Be a good test question. So you can think of that. You can see, test yourself. See if you can answer that. If you can answer that, you've done well. And you'll find <laughs> your GSIs will tell you the answer 
hopefully in recitation, if, they, if you remember to ask them. <laughs> <laughs>